Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought I'd do a little video here on the full width at half maximum. Now, I'm not going to talk about what it means or where it comes from, but I'm going to talk about some of the different things that affect full width at half maximum, such as the altitude of our target that we're looking at, the eccentricity of the stars that we're ultimately getting, particularly at long focal lengths, how Bohr Exterminator affects it, but also how it's presented to us in software that we're used to using, such as PixInsight, Nina. ASTAP and ZWO's ASI Studio FitzView program. It turns out we don't know as much about full width and maximum of our images as we think we do. Let's take a look. But why do we care about star size and shape? Star shape, characterized as the full width at half maximum, a diameter, if you will, is a good measure of image resolution. In other words, if there is some feature, a dust lane, for example, that has a width smaller than full width at half maximum, then you have no hope of being able to resolve it with your telescope. Now, full width at half maximum isn't the only measure of the size of a star. Some programs will port results in terms of half flux radius and half flux diameter. And I cover the meaning of half flux diameter and half flux radius, how it compares to full width at half maximum in a separate video that I'll post in the description of this video. We're gonna confine our discussion to the full width at half maximum and if you happen to have the half-flux diameter, such as is provided by ASTAP, then just multiply that number times 1.09. If you have half-flux radius, multiply by 2.18, and then you have approximately what the full width at half-maximum would be. Unfortunately, stars aren't always round, and that certainly is the case when you're imaging with a long focal length telescope, as we do during galaxy season. They tend to be somewhat egg-shaped. What you'll typically find, though, is that the, your stars will be stretched in the RA direction, because that's where gear mechanics, machining tolerances, etc., come into play, and that's where PhD2 is trying to do its work in keeping the guide star centered. Image analysis apps, both in real time and in post-processing, NINA in real time, APT in real time, PixInsight post-processing, ASTAP in post-processing, and FitzView uh, in post-processing, all can provide some measure of star size. But you have to be careful because the star size may be reported in terms of pixels or in terms of arc seconds. It's often a good idea to use star size or star shape as a metric in selecting images for a final stack. You might want to be more selective if you're looking for detail in an image, for example, with luminance and HA, and you might want to be more permissive if it's just stacking images for color, RGB, maybe O3 and S2. The problem is there's a lot of variability here, not just in terms of the altitude, eccentricity, and what Bohr Exterminator might do, but the applications themselves, Nina, Chicksensite, ASTAP, and FitzView, just to name a few that I'll be talking about here, have their own variability and leaves us wondering what is the actual full width at half maximum. Let's start off with the altitude. Here's a picture of what the density looks like as it goes from very high altitude. In this case, I'm cutting it off at 50 kilometers. And as we get closer to sea level, you can see a significant increase in density. When we look up directly towards Zenus, if we had a box that was one meter by one meter and then the height of 50 kilometers, the weight of the air in there divided by g is one air mass. It's the mass of air in the air column pointed towards zenith. But of course, we don't always get to image at zenith. And sometimes we're looking off at some altitude angle theta. And in this case, that box that we're talking about is now longer than the one pointed up at zenith. And as a result, the air mass or the mass of the air increases by one over sine theta. And you've seen this before if you use stellarium, for example. If I take this theta, that's the altitude angle here of 23.93 degrees, I take one over sine of that angle, and that's equal to 2.46. And that is what the 2.46 air masses represents up here in the information box in Stellarium. Air mass is an important parameter because it has a direct relation with the full width at half maximum. As you get more air mass, as you look through air, more air mass relative to zenith, your apparent size of the star will tend to increase. So the full width at half maximum at zenith is the best you have on a given night, and it just increases from there as you image away from zenith by a factor of the air mass to the 0.6 power. So, for example, if we're imaging up at 90 degrees altitude, that's at zenith, the multiplication factor is 1. 
Now, as we come down to say 30 degrees below zenith, so now we're at 60, we're almost at about a multiplication factor of 1.1. So in other words, a 10% increase in the full width at half maximum. If we come all the way down to 30 degrees of altitude, now the full width at half maximum has increased by about 50%. And if we're down at 20 degrees, our star shapes have increased to twice the size. So if you're concerned about getting good detailed data, for instance, with the luminous channel or the hydrogen alpha channel, you might want to do your imaging very close to the maximum altitude that that target will get to. And then as you stray away from that zone near the maximum altitude, you can switch to filters that you might want to use for just acquiring color data. As we image at long focal lengths, especially during galaxy season, we're not only magnifying the targets we're looking at, we're also magnifying the effects of gear noise and periodic error in our mounts as we're trying to guide through that with PhD2. When we get egg-shaped stars, we don't just have one nice circular star to deal with. We have a maximum full width at half maximum along the long axis and a minimum full width at half maximum along the narrow axis. Full width at half maximum that Pix Insight reports to you in their subframe selector process is just the square root of the product of those two numbers. If your eccentricity is zero, then you're right along the central line here and you have a perfect circular star. With an eccentricity of 0.25, you probably can't tell the difference and it looks like a perfect circular star. Once you get out to an eccentricity of 0.5, now you have a minimum full width at half maximum down here and a maximum value up here. It turns out that the minimum values tend to be in the declination direction and the maximum tends to be along the RA axis because that's where the gear noise and where PhD2 is trying to make guiding adjustments to keep the guide star centered. So it turns out that this eccentricity is actually a pretty good measure of the quality of your mount. If you were to go out and buy an EQ8R instead of what I have, which is the Skywatcher EQ6R, I'm spending money that's not going to improve the seeing conditions above my telescope at all, obviously. Instead, what it's going to do is be provide me with a better machined piece of equipment that will give me lower eccentricity values, and now my RA and deck values will be very close. My star shapes will be much more circular. Now let's take a look at some of the data I've been getting lately with my C925 imaging with the focal reducer at 13, 18 millimeters. And as you can see, I'm getting a pretty good spread on my data in terms of the maximum full width at half maximum and the minimum. And that puts me with a typical eccentricity between 0.5 and 0.6. During each imaging session, I have Nina write out the file name with the date and the time, but I also have it included the full width at half maximum in arc seconds as provided by the Hocus Focus plugin. And then when I do the calibration and debayering, I hand all the images over to Xinsight subframe selector process and have it come up with the full width at half maximum and the eccentricity. And I plug that into this formula over here for the maximum full width at half maximum and just add that on to the beginning of the file name multiplied by 100. So in other words, this is 2.95 compared to 3.89. But this way I can sort the images and select the highest resolution images for stacking, for example. Now, I've been doing this for quite a while, and there's one thing about this that has always raised a question in my mind, which is, why in the world is this number, 2.95, less than full width at half maximum that I'm getting out of Nina? In other words, this number, if these two programs are computing full width at half maximum in an identical way, this number should be higher than what the Nina number is. That comparison has always made me wonder what's going on, and that's one of the reasons I'm making this video here. The minimum full width at half maximum, these guys along here in these red triangles, that's probably your best indicator of what the actual seeing is and what you're achieving with your image. The maximum full width at half maximum, or more accurately, the difference between the maximum and the minimum values here is really a measure of the quality of your mount. Now let's go take a look at how other programs calculate the full width at half maximum and just see what the trends are. So here are those same 500 images. And what I'm doing now is I'm taking the value that I'm getting out of PixInsight subframe selector. So that's the full width at half maximum along this axis and also within the file name as you saw we have the full width at half maximum that Nina calculates they're consistently higher than what I'm getting out of Pix Insight. Now I've also given these images to the astrometric stacking program ASTAP and had it calculate the half flux diameter 
And in this case, I just converted the half flux diameter into a full width at half maximum in arc seconds. And you can see that we get yet another set of data with perhaps a little more scatter to it than what I'm getting out of NINA. But the magnitudes of the NINA calculated and ASTEP calculated values are pretty similar, even though they do have different trends. And in fact, there's some real outliers. If you were going by ASTAP, you might be uh, tempted to use these image, one of these images here as your reference image and stack or align all of your data to this image. That wouldn't be a good idea. It turns out if you take a close look at this image, it's not nearly as good as some of these images over here at the lower values that at the lower values of full width at half maximum. So if I just go out to three, for example, and say, here's an image that has a full width at half maximum of three, well, ASTAP tells me, no, it's more like 3.6, and NINA tells me, no, it's more like 3.9. So what is the real value for full width at half maximum? Man, I have no idea. CWO is providing the ASI Studio, which has a number of applications, and one of them is a program that allows you to just flip through like a blink utility, the uh, fits images that you collect. And one of the features they've added to it and have adjusted over time is this little button down here, which you can click on and it will identify all the stars and give it a star size. How does this star size compare to what we just saw out of PixInsight, ASTAP, and Nina. The problem with FitzView is it doesn't have a batch mode, so it can't just evaluate a stack of images and give you a, a printed out table of what the values are. So I had to pick eight different images and this is what I came up with. Once again, I have the PixInsight full width at half maximum along the horizontal axis here. So if I come along to this point, guess what? If I assume that star size is the half flux diameter in pixels, and then I convert that to the full width at half maximum in arc seconds, it's right on the line. The trend continues to move away. And as we're down here, we have as much error on the low side of the full width at half maximum as calculated by PixInsight as we do from ASTAP and NINA on the high side. But now we have four different programs computing something like the full width at half maximum, and yet they're all providing different numbers. In the end, I'm not entirely sure what star size is as is reported by the FitzView program. But the trend looks pretty good, but again, the trend looks pretty good here for the ASTAP images. And we saw these wide outliers and the amount of scatter in the ASTAP data. So I wouldn't recommend just because we see eight numbers here that look like it's giving a good trend that assume, we should assume it's going to be a good trend for the 500 images because this is an awful small sample size. We're all a big fan of what Blur Exterminator is doing to our images. We look like much more bring it astrophotographers after we let Blur Exterminator mess around with our images. If I take the raw values of full width and half maximum as calculated by PixInsight, and then I give that same image to Blur Exterminator, I get a lower, as you might expect, full width at half maximum. And you can see that trend is pretty good here. And when I look at this image, I think back to that image I had with the full width at half maximum maximum and the full width at half maximum minimum. And so those values fall right in line with the minimum full width at half maximum. And so what I thought might be happening here is or exterminator is going in and seeing that I've got some eccentric stars and what, account, what amounts to my RA direction, and it's through the miracle of deconvolution, it's reducing the eccentricity and bringing the stars more, making them more round, and therefore moving the star sizes more in line with what I'm getting for my minimum full width at half maximum values, and that made total sense to me. But then I went to look at the eccentricity values, and I'll be darned if the eccentricity, as calculated by Pix Insight subframe selector, is actually a higher eccentricity after or exterminator has worked on the image than it was before or exterminator worked on the image. So I'm actually getting a more ex I'm getting more eccentric stars out of Bohr Exterminator than I had when I went in. Now it is reducing the size of the stars altogether. There are a few things I need to look into with Bohr Exterminator. I, I certainly do see better resolution, or at least think I do, but I've also noticed that it randomizes the color balance of the stars. And of course, there is this eccentricity issue. Well, the full width at half maximum is a measure of our image resolution. So it's a pretty important parameter. We tend to get more egg-shaped stars, particularly in galaxy season when we're relying on long focal length telescopes. And so there's a full width at half maximum maximum value along the long dimension of the star. 
and a full width at half maximum minimum value across the more the narrow width of the star. Eccentricity of the star is, is really an indication of your mount quality. If you want to reduce the eccentricity of the star, there may be a few things you can do from guiding perspective. In the end, you're going to run into just the limitations of what PhD2 can uh, compensate for given your mount mechanics and the image scale that you're going after with the large focal length telescope you're using. But if you want to reduce the eccentricity, you're probably going to have to shell out some real dollars to get a much more precisely manufactured mount so that the star size and the RA direction is more in line with what you're seeing in the declination direction. We also know that as we look away from zenith and closer to the horizon, our stars just get larger. And it turns out there is an, a theoretical relationship between the full width at half maximum at zenith and the full width at half maximum for some altitude angle. And that altitude angle governs the amount of air that we're looking through, and it's the air mass raised to the 0.6 power that shows the uh, scale factor that's applied to our best possible full width at half maximum. We took a look at a few programs that provide an image-wide assessment of star shape. In this case, Nina picks inside ASTAP and Fitzview. They all provide a measure of star size. It might be in full width at half maximum in arc seconds. It might be in half flux diameter in pixels. But the HFD values can be converted to full width at half maximum in arc seconds. Each one of these pieces of software provides a different value for the same image. The fact is there is a trend and most of these programs agree fairly well on what the trend is. Nina and Six Insights seem to have a pretty consistent trend with minimal scatter. That would make it useful for selecting images for a stack if you want to preserve detail, for example. For myself, I use the maximum full width at half maximum computer from Pix Insights full width at half maximum. Uh, for my image grading. Blur Exterminator performs a lot of magic, as we know, when we look at what it does to our images. What I expected to see was that Blur Exterminator would reduce the eccentricity of the star in the RA direction and provide me with a smaller, more circular star and therefore better resolution in the RA direction. And in fact, that's not what's happening at all. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. I'm going to take a look at that sometime. Okay, guys, well, that's all I have for now. I hope you have some clear skies, but if you came here looking for answers, I'm just letting you leave with more questions. Talk to you guys later.